So I may have falsely advertised the extent to which I will describe what's going on in the sodium borohydride reduction. Uh, if you're hoping to see the actual magic, I am not going to show you an honest-to-goodness mechanism for the magic. And largely that's because I don't know it myself. It's not super important. We do know how this works, big picture, so we can kind of predict how it's going to happen. But the details are totally beyond the scope of this course. However, I do want you to think about borane by itself and the ways in which this informs borohydride, because we're going to use sodium borohydride a lot and you should understand generally how it works and why it works the way it does. So here's the idea. Borane has three hydrogens bound to it and that should look weird to you because if I ask you what the geometry is of this boron, you should recognize that actually the hybridization is sp2 which means that this is a trigonal planar molecule and the reason why is because boron only brings three electrons to any Lewis structure and so it's going to want to exist like that. However, if we have some means of giving it something else, if we can say put another hydrogen onto it, then what we form is a molecule that's going to be unhappy for different reasons. Obviously, borane itself is unhappy because it lacks for an octet. This boron only has six electrons around it, so it lacks for an octet. But as soon as we put eight electrons around it, which is to say borohydride, the reactive part of sodium borohydride, then what you notice is that the boron has a minus on it. And this this likewise is unhappy. So if borane is unhappy as it exists as BH3 and it's unhappy in this form, you imagine that this is fairly reactive stuff. Borane is a good Lewis acid. It always has an empty orbital to be a filled by other electrons. But as soon as you fill that orbital with electrons, then all of a sudden you have reached a relatively unhappy situation. This boron now is looking to deliver its electrons somewhere else. As another illustration of exactly what's going on here, I'm going to draw another borane molecule and I'm going to draw it down here and the reason why I'm doing this is because something very strange happens. You can actually have a situation where two boranes will come close to each other and electron density from one of these BH bonds is going to flow into that empty orbital and the electron density from this BH bond is going to flow in that orbital and so what you end up actually isolating is diborane. Nature will make this for you if you allow BH3 to react with itself in some sense. And what you're having here is very strange orbitals. These are bonds that we describe as three center, boron, H, boron, but only two electrons across both of these. And so it's essentially a way of trying to get boron to have formal octets while not bearing any charge. Again, this is very, very weird. And if you are interested in learning more about this, this is really the domain of inorganic chemistry. So three center, two electron bonds are nature's way of solving this. We are shortly going to exploit the fact that boron both wants another pair of electrons and doesn't want it in reactions with alkenes. So you'll see how borane reductions work in, in alkenes. But for now, what you really need to know is that sodium borohydride is not happy as it currently stands, and it's going to be a decent to excellent source of H-. Really, the only way to make this happy, to go back to borane, is to make H- go away. You either need to add H- minus in one sense or subtract H- minus in order to convert between these two structures. Obviously, that's not how you make it, but this is going to be a source of H-. minus. So if I have something nearby, say a mercury bond, then it almost certainly is going to be willing to pick up a new hydrogen from this. Now, what I'm about to draw you is not the magic. This is not how this mechanism goes. In fact, this mechanism is believed to occur via some sort of radical Probably to the mercury. The mercury probably then does some horrible thing like creating radicals and so on and so forth. That doesn't matter. The upshot is you can think of this as H minus replacing the mercury. And in fact, if you see sodium borohydride, think of it always as a source of H minus. It will deliver H minus. And the way it works may be by delivering two electrons at once, but it may also work some other way. And again, the details aren't super important usually. The upshot for the purposes of the chemistry that I want 
want you to know is that you can, in fact, replace a carbon mercury bond with a carbon hydrogen bond. And really what you need to know is that if you have some substrate and you perform an oxymercuration reduction sequence, the result is that you add water in a Markovnikov-like fashion. So again, step one is going to be the mercury set of reagents, and step two is going to be sodium borohydride. The result is going to be addition of water across the double bond in a Markovnikov-like fashion. This is always called an oxymercuration reduction sequence. The point of this video is to point out that borane is an unusual molecule because it both needs electron density and wants to get rid of electron density when it has it. So if you see sodium borohydride, it will react as though it has too much electron density. And what it is trying to do is to remove a boron H bond. By the same token, of course, you can predict what happens if you make aluminum hydride. It's going to be exactly the same as boron hydride only more so because aluminum really 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 doesn't want to have the extra electron density. Aluminum is just under boron on the periodic table so it reacts largely the same way but it's basically sodium borohydride with the reactivity amped up.